Okay, so let's continue with the session of this afternoon. Now we have the talk from Aku Kamonen. Aku is a PhD at KTH, and it's currently a postdoc here at our group. Aku will be talking about his work named Adaptive Random Fourier Features Based on Metropolis Sampling. You can start, Aku. Okay, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here. Uh, so my goal today is to yeah, explain these words in the title here. <laughs> so my supervisor used to say that the title in your talk, you need to go through the talk, the words that's, that's written there. So hopefully we will have some more knowledge about these words. I think you have heard some of them before, but maybe not in the in one sentence like this. So this talk will be about <clears throat> three different topics, all connected. Um, the first two are published work and uh, they are together with, with these guys here. So it's Jonas Kiesling, Peter Peshak, Matthias Sandberg, Anders Sepessi, and uh, Raul Tempone, who is here. Then I will also talk about some, uh, some current work later, where there are uh, some other authors as well, but well, well, collaborators. OK, so <clears throat> first, suppose we are given some data, some x and y points. The x points are in RD and y points are in R. We assume that the data is such that it comes from some unknown distribution, uh, rho tilde there. And <clears throat> we also assume that it exists an underlying function f, such that if you add some noise to f and evaluate any x point of this data set, then you get y. We assume that the, the expected value of the noise is zero and it has some bounded variance. So this is standard supervised learning problem, right? So how do we find f? Can we approximate f somehow, just given the data? So one way of doing it is to form a least squares problem, uh, like we have done here. So this is an expected value uh, with respect to the data here. Uh, we have y and x there that we've seen. But this new here from the previous slide then is that we have something called beta here. And this is a neural network with a trigonometric activation function. Now, when we talk about machine learning and so on, we frequently talk about weights and biases. Um, and here we have a complex valued activation function. So we don't need the bias in the sense that we usually have in the machine learning. Instead, I will call these weights for amplitudes and these weights for frequencies, which I mean makes sense in a, from a Fourier perspective. Um, <clears throat> this uh, least squares problem, uh, it's a non-convex problem in the, the frequencies omega. Uh, and the lambda here is a tick on parameter. Okay, so to motivate uh, the choice of this activation function, I will just recall the definition of the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, yeah. everyone has seen this. Uh, we assume that F and F hat are in L1. So what we will do is that we make an, a Monte Carlo approximation of the inverse Fourier transform by, okay, we take uh, uppercase K, uh, IID samples of the frequencies from, from some P, so, some probability density function P, and we do the Monte Carlo approximation of the inverse Fourier transform, which becomes this expression, right? We can gather all these things together and call it alpha hat. And yeah, maybe this gives some kind of intuition to why we can call them amplitudes and frequencies. Okay, so- Sorry, the... one question. Yeah. Just for better motivation. I didn't try Fourier, but I tried generalized polynomial Gauss expansion. So what is the motivation to take Fourier basis? So, but yeah, I will show a little more here how, how we get into this, but. Um, okay. You can take uh, Chebyshev, Lagrange, Laguerre. Is it, is it all these polynomials are orthogonal also? Yeah, I, I, so I don't say we don't have, a, okay. I, I, I don't know how to do it with the, the basis functions you're talking with, but talking about, but um, hopefully this gets a little more clear when we go 
uh, go forward here. So, okay. Um, so by straightforward calculations, I mean, this, this alpha here, you can compute the expected value, it's f of x, and you can compute the variance, right? Um, <clears throat> so the, the non-convex uh, least squares problem that I talked about just a moment ago is here. Um, of course, instead of minimizing with respect to the, the frequencies, you can just take the mean of the frequencies. Uh, I mean, the mean is greater than or equal to the minimum. What you have then, if you do that, is that you have an inner minimization problem here uh, with respect to the amplitudes. And this is a linear, it's a convex optimization problem. But okay, just taking the mean over the, the frequencies is maybe not the best thing. So what we try to do is that we minimize with respect to, to P over all the probability density functions then. Um, and okay. We can also uh, derive an error estimate. So I will come back to this P and at, I, I will come back to this expression later, but first there's a classic paper by Baron from 1993 um, that we can follow to, um, to get this one over K error uh, uh, estimate for, for this minimization problem. And uh, okay, we have one over K here, but then you have a constant here and this constant um, can be minimized um, with respect to P. Okay. So in the paper from 2020, uh, we do that. Uh, it's a classical result in um, optimal uh, important sampling that you can derive this kind of optimal P for, for this kind of expression. So I'm sorry uh, yeah. also for better understanding. Is it one D-dimensional Fourier basis or it's multidimensional Fourier? It's multidimensional Fourier transform, yeah. Thank you. So, okay. And then it turns out that to minimize this constant, then there's an optimal P, which is the, I mean, it's the absolute value of the Fourier transform, uh, normalized them to make a, a probability density function. Okay. So that's good and all, but we don't even have access to F and neither do we have access to F hat. We only have the data. So how do we sample from this P then? Okay. That's a question that that's not obvious how to do, but so we have algorithm that we propose. So we have this problem that I, I showed before that we took the, the mean is greater than or equal to the minimum and then we minimize with respect to P. Okay, so try to solve this problem then. So here's an overview. a random walk in the frequencies. Okay, so you take one step of this random walk, you get some proposal frequencies, you solve the convex problem. The inner problem here is convex. And that can be done, for example, I mean, there are many ways of solving that. One way of doing it is to you form the normal equations and you solve the normal equations uh, with any favorite solver. Then you get some amplitudes, proposal amplitudes, Okay, so you have the previous amplitudes, previous frequencies, and you have the proposal amplitudes and frequencies. Then you take a test here. You take the proposal for each, I mean, this is k-dimensional. So you take for each k, you take a test of the proposal amplitude divided by the previous amplitude to a parameter gamma. Um, okay, so we, we can see gamma as a hyperparameter here. Um, but it turns out that you can uh, adjust it to minimize the work and uh, convergence and so on. So what this is, this is a metropolis test, right? If our distribution would be beta hat. But our, the, the distribution we wanna sample from is P, is this one, right? So F hat. So it's not exactly a metropolis algorithm. It, I mean, we are not sampling from, from from the optimal distribution from this P, but we put beta hat here instead. Okay. And here's the whole algorithm, um, which I gave an overview. So you input some data, you get the neural network. Because you have to choose some 
uh, number of iterations. You can do that in you know, different ways by choosing a sampling time or just setting them directly. Initialize the frequencies, uh, solve for the amplitudes for those initial frequencies. And uh, okay, so here's the random walk. You solve for, for the amplitudes. And then um, here's the metropolis test then. So you, you test if this quotient is greater than um, a, a random number uniformly sampled between zero and one. Okay, and if that's true, then you accept the frequencies and, and the amplitudes and you iterate this, okay, until you have uh, run as long as you want. There is something uh, here about uh, mod m equal to zero. So uh, this can be skipped. This is just, okay, you can minimize the work uh, a little bit by not updating the data hats every iteration. But, yeah, I think it confuses more than it, it helps. Okay, so. Yep. For uh, in the metropolis step, or what do you mean? So if we. No, it's not obvious that we would sample from the op uh, optimal distribution. The, the best we have a, is a heuristical argument, and we have a proof of weak convergence of the amplitudes when you do that, but which could motivate that it could work, and experimentally it seemed to work. So it's not obvious at all. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Okay, how, how um, um, what do I want to say? Yes, okay. Suppose f is given by, by this expression. This is the si is something called the sine integral, which is defined like this. Um, so we take the sine integral of the first component of x divided by some constant a, and then times a Gaussian. So it, the Gaussian makes it decay in all directions. Um, but in the first component, we have, this, we call it the regularized discontinuity. You will, you will show how it looks like. And this a, it kind of, defines how how steep it is so so here i have just plotted this function for a equal to one and then if i make a a little smaller to 10 to the minus one 10 to the minus two you so you see it gets like more and more steep it looks more like a discontinuous function okay so at this might look at okay is this some artifact of what is happening here um so no uh, it's the intrinsic behavior of this target function so it looks here is zoomed in very much, and we can see these oscillations. And this is for the case when a is 10 to the minus 3. So another feature of this uh, target function is that the Fourier transform of it has uh, a fat tail uh, from plus minus uh, 1 over a. So here a is 10 to the minus 3. So it has a fat tail here between uh, minus 1,000 and plus 1,000. After that, it, I mean, it decays exponentially. So it's, it's, in practice, it's zero. Okay. So can you see? Okay, so the, each time we're looking at one, some, one thing that is blue here. So we start with this one and then we can see the blue dots or hopefully we can see them. So uh, constructing this target function in, uh, okay, one dimension and uh, running stochastic gradient descent, where we have initialized the, the frequencies from a normal distribution with uh, variance 50 squared. It looks something like this. So, okay, here's the square root of the error. So it's, it's supposed to be one uh, over a square root of K then. So, so we can see that it follows this one over square root of K and then it starts to stagnate a bit here. Uh, just running random Fourier features. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if you just sample the, the frequencies from, a, from some distribution, you solve directly for the amplitudes and that's it. There's no, no iteration or adaptivity in it. Okay, so if you do that, that's also supposed to have the one over K, but we are not in an uh, asymptotic zone here. So, okay, it's quite uh, flat. Then the next thing here is if we do the, uh, Stochastic gradient descent just initialized from a standard normal distribution. Also looks quite flat. And okay, I call it fixed covariance matrix here, but this is the, the um, adaptive random Fourier features algorithm that I just presented. And here we can see the one over one over K of one over square root of K. In that paper, we also uh, present another algorithm. So in the random walk, 
you you have to sample these these steps like you can stamp, sample them from a standard normal distribution or or multivariate normal distribution but you can also adaptively adjust the covariance matrix in that proposal step and if you do that uh, following a paper by uh, Finnish guys I don't remember their name anymore um, then you get something uh, okay like this one <laughs> Uh, I'm a little ahead, ahead of myself. Okay, then there's another thing here that sure, we are using the trigonometric activation function. Easily plug in a, diff, a sigmoid activation function in this algorithm and run it. You get something like this, and this also looks quite good. Okay. Here's a histogram over the frequencies um, when we have run this. Uh, the, previous example there and we can see that okay so the upper row here is um, the initial state of the frequencies excuse me so um, in the upper left here we have a stochastic gradient descent where we have initialized the frequencies from a standard normal distribution and here is from that active metropolis then we have initialized the frequencies at zero so all of them are there and then down here we have uh, after we have run 10 to the 7 iterations of stochastic gradient descent and the histogram has not changed much you can see the scale is the same in this we have minus 5 minus 5 here the scale is different in 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 this figure which we cannot see is too small so it's from plus minus 1000 in this scale. and after 10 to the 3 iterations then we can see that we already have support from I mean the, here is minus 400 and there's plus 400 and this is in the case when the a was 10 to the minus 3 so we're supposed to find something yeah um so d okay 10 to the 3 1000 times yeah yeah exactly so okay you have a point there. so you, you to compare with different how long time this actually takes the computational complexity yeah. okay yeah okay so um and it's uh okay so we can see that the support has grown the distribution looks more like it's supposed to look like but i haven't shown exactly how it's supposed to look like you have seen the okay you have seen this one here is how it's supposed to look like to some extent um but then uh in another example so uh, i ran more recently here um the a is 10 to the minus 2 instead uh, for eight thousand iterations uh okay so this was in dimension four so this is only along the first axis, which is supposed to look like something like this, uh, not uh, giving, I mean, the normalizing constant is different in these, these histograms. And here are 10,000 samples of the frequencies, and here is just 1,024. But you see, qualitatively, they look quite similar. Um, in the other axis, they are supposed to be normal distribution, and uh, they look normal distributed there as well. I haven't measured any distance from between the distributions or anything like that, but um, yes, yeah, so it's a, a qualitative result. Here, then, um, we actually have time on axis. So, uh, so the green one is the one where we adaptively adjust the, the covariance matrix, um, and the red one is the the just adaptive metropolis algorithm and stochastic gradient descent then the target function here then so here uh, we switch the target function from the previous slide so here's an anisotropic gaussian function in two dimension and what does anisotropic means it means that the level sets are like elliptically shaped right so we see that okay stochastic gradient descent it it converges but it goes more slowly And of course, this is run on the, the same machine on two different occasions, so uh, measure the time. So it's, uh, then um, you all know the, the MNIST, the, the handwritten uh, digits. So you can use this algorithm for in classification as well. And how I set up this was to train 10 neural networks. 
one neural network each for each handwritten digit. And the neural network's task is to say, is this a number one or not? Is this a number five or not? And so on. Okay. And then uh, when you give a handwritten digit, all of them gives a number is between zero and one and the highest one wins. And then if you do that, then you can say, okay, how many do, mis do we misclassify? So the percentages here are the misclassification rates. And K is the width of the neural network. So when K increases, we see that, um, yeah, we can look at the left here. So this is just the random Fourier feature. There's no adaptivity, just sample the frequencies from a standard normal distribution. You can see that the mis they misclassify a lot, but it's slightly decreasing, right? Then if you manually just trial and error, adjust the, the variance of the, uh, <laughs> The, the normal distribution of frequencies that you sample in random Fourier feature sense. You can get quite nice result I mean, in this table compared to the other results in this table. But then if you run this algorithm that we present, then you can get 1.98% misclassification rate. And for this value, okay. Um, so this is not in any sense groundbreaking or <laughs> even close to, to the the best classifiers, but then just it, it can be used in classification problems. Yes. Sorry, I was probably not listening carefully. Somehow I started with, or you started with Fourier, then some examples, and then neural networks. Can you please show slides where you move from uh, Fourier to neural networks? Um, so the neural network is, I mean, the neural network has a trigonometric activation function. So this can be seen as a neural network, right? With the trigonometric activation function, you have these weights and these weights. These weights I call uh, amplitudes and these I call frequencies. So this is an inverse, uh, the, the a Monte Carlo approximation of the inverse Fourier transform, right? So here is, in the Fourier sense, and then you just call this whole lump for uh, alpha hat k. And then the goal is to find alpha hat k and omega to uh, approximate the, the target. But function. you are not uh, constructing neural networks with layers with... Uh, no, it's just, okay, so we're all the time working with one hidden layer neural network. There's no deep, deep neural networks yet, but... So just, hmm? yeah, yeah. So I'm coming into some residual neural networks as well. So, but for now it's uh, just shallow neural networks. Okay. Uh, can I have a question also? Yep. Uh, why why did you have to split your, your model into 10, 10 diff isolated models to do the oh, MNIST the... classification and not have one that, uh, has a 10 dimensional out, output. No, you can do that as well. You can do that. Yeah. It was a choice. We did it like this. I don't remember. There was in KTH. So I just tried something that and it gave a result. So. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I, no, yeah. I was thinking if it, this was a limitation of the model somehow that you needed to have a 1D output or, or okay. This is good. No, so the, the difference becomes if you do that in a higher dimension, then the, the amplitudes become in dimension 10. Yeah. Okay, so, so that is doable. And then in the uh, Metropolis test, when you take the absolute value of the, um, the so, okay, this bold beta hat will be in, in dimension KD instead, okay, instead of K1. Okay, so then you, for each K, you have a 10 dimensional thing. So you need, then you need to define the norm that you take in this uh, Metropolis test. But yeah, yeah, it's doable. We have done some, some things on that as well, but okay, nothing I have. To I'm saying, okay. yeah. Uh, table a little bit confusing. Usually they say how many classes there are and how many uh, samples you classify. What is K here? Number of classes or number of it's, samples? It's the width of the neural network okay. of each of the... Okay, so... Uh, is it important how times. many samples you had here or not? Oh. So I, I used the standard MNIST. How many is it? 20,000? I don't remember. 60,000, yeah. And then the the as a training set and then you have the test sets but so just do the standard participation of uh, a partition of the the amnists uh, yeah i didn't include the details here at all it just uh, I, I did a most standard way of doing that uh, 
Yeah. The reason to, I should ask, I should have asked this at the beginning, but the reason to split the problem, uh, the way the, the amplitudes and the frequencies is just to, to get a, a convex optimization problem. Yeah, yeah. So the, the idea is that, <clears throat> Uh, yes, you split it up and then you have a convex problem and then the question is how to find the, the frequencies and then we need to sample the frequencies somehow. So um, we, we started looking at random feature algorithm or the random Fourier features and it's in many ways you, in many situations, you just sample all of them, right? So can we do something better? And then we, yeah, I mean, one thing led to the other. <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, okay, so here I just plotted the error then for the, uh, the MNIST classification problem as well. Um, no, let's see, this is misclassification rate we have on this axis as well. So, okay, it also follows, uh, well, at some parts at least this one over square, square root of k, if we take the, the square root of the mean square term. Um, okay, so the green ones are just sampling the standard normal. This is pretty much the table that is plotted here. Okay, residual neural networks. Okay, I haven't written out the, the, um, the least squares problem here, but suppose you wanna, uh, again, you're given data, you wanna fit a residual neural network to that data. And with the residual neural network, I mean this expression, this whole thing, or this is our residual neural network with uppercase L layers. Okay, it can be expressed as this recursive uh, expression here. We have um, two sums. So if we start from the right, we have, uh, again, a trigonometric activation function. We have frequencies, we have access to the data. Uh, and some amplitudes. Then we have another term here, which also has an, uh, a trigonometric activation function, but instead of the data directly, it has the previous layer here, or set L times some omega, and, and sometimes some frequencies and some amplitudes. Okay, so yeah, I made a diagram of that, that neural network also, I don't know if it, clarifies anything, but data comes from, from the left and then we have the, neuro, the residual neural network here. And each layer then has access to the, uh, to the input data here. And uh, yeah, Z, Z2, Z3 and so on. Z1 is equal to zero. And then um, for each layer, so I call these terms for this for B and this for C that we sub-index L. Okay. So, So I, I just define this whole um, sum for layer L with, with sub-index L. It's, the, it, it's, it's exactly this expression that I have just, uh, I, I just call this thing for B and this for C with sub-index L. It is nothing, nothing more to it. Um, okay, so then again, the question is how do we find this set L? So the standard way of doing this is that, okay, you form a least squares problem as a cost function, you initialize the amplitudes and frequencies, you run some optimizer, for example, stochastic gradient descent, Adam or, or whatever, and you eva evaluate the result. Okay, what we propose is that we do a slightly change here. So some words become red here and change. So instead of standard approach, we have a pre-training approach. And instead of initialize amplitudes and frequencies, we pre-train the amplitudes and frequencies. Okay, and we do that layer by layer with the adaptive metropolis algorithm. Okay, so that's the difference. 
of how we can do this. So here is the layer by layer training in a, uh, expressed as a minimization with respect to the amplitudes. So again, assume that we sample the frequencies with adaptive metropolis, and then you need to solve this problem for uh, the, the amplitudes B and C for each layer. So you do that first for layer one. Okay, in the first layer said zero is equal to zero. So this term is zero and we have zero in the exponent here. So it's just a constant and it, we pretty much just have a one hidden layer in neural networks that tries to approximate Y. Okay, so you we then you run, excuse me, you run the uh, adaptive metrop uh, adaptive random uh, adaptive metropolis algorithm to sample the, the frequencies and you solve for the amplitudes. Then when you have done that, okay, until some uh, error tolerance or whatever, then you go to the next layer. Okay, so you plug in your previous layer here and wherever, and in a way you can see this as the difference here is a residual from the previous layer. So you, you try to fit this to the negative of that residual for each layer. And there's some motivation for doing this in the paper as well. But um, if you do this in practice then, okay, so again, the regularized uh, discontinuity, discontinuous function that um, we looked at, if you do this in 10 dimensions, so. Uh, it's not a true 10 dimensional function in the sense that all other dimensions except the first is just a Gaussian decay, right? But and anyways, so the difference, as I mentioned, is how you initialize, how you initialize the, the weights and the, the, frequ uh, the frequencies and the amplitudes. In both cases, we run Adam, Adam's afterwards. On so the whole thing, you need to, you need to approximate, um, you need to train the neural, residual neural network globally because they are connected all the layers you can't just do it layer by layer but that seems to serve as a, a good enough initialization to boost adam further so if you do this uh, okay here we initialize and with savior it's also called uh, golorot it is one, one of the initializers we tried someone okay um we see that we get the after 10 runs we get uh, a smaller error, uh, average of the errors, outcomes of these 10 runs um, consistently in this experiment. So the standard deviation of the error outcomes is much smaller for the layer by layer method. So here on the left side, I have plotted the, uh, the target function, the first dimension of the target function. And uh, uh, so the blue one is the target function and the red one is the neural network after running some iterations then. Okay, so down here we have after doing the layer by layer and up here we have uh, after initializing each layer. And to the right, I have plotted the, the target function towards the target function in blue. So um, optimally the red would be above the blue. So, uh, yeah, if you blot the target function towards itself, of course, it becomes just a line. But if you plot the neural network towards the target function, then um, you get something else. Okay. So this is one of these 10 runs that I did here. Okay, so then a little bit theoretical here. Um, I'm cannot go through all the details and uh, I don't want to go and get into too many details here either, but just to show uh, a main theorem, a result from that, from a paper we have on these um, residual neural networks. So, okay, for some technical reasons in the paper that uh, we first define uh, a least squares problem for one hidden layer neural network and we, which defines an optimizer for that, beta star. And then if you plug that one in there, you try to fit a residual neural network to this residual. You, you can look at beta star as zero, just for simplicity. Uh, I'm sure it's possible to go through all the details and do that in the paper as well. But at the time that we finished it, this was uh, a technical issue. 
Okay, then we have a delta bar here, regularizer. And this all comes from that the theory in the paper, we, we look at uh, a continuous optimal control problem. And then uh, this is, uh, you, you, if you move this set out to the left side, you see that it can take the limit in L <coughs> divided by uh, the difference in this L here, you have a derivative, right? And these become integrals in the limit. Okay, so we don't have to go through all the details here, but if all these things are bounded, um, then we say that, okay, the residual neural network uh, approximates your data uh, as something over LK. So number of layers is L and K is number of nodes per layer. Okay, uh, and we have some optimal uh, distributions of the frequencies as well, um, which is not, we, we're not gonna go into details. So what, something that is important here, a key point that, that theorem 2.1 that I showed there briefly, it implies that there exist functions that are better approximated with deep residual neural networks compared to shallow ones even if the number of degrees of freedom is the same. I mean, many of you have seen that intuitively. And okay, you have a deep neural network, you train, you get the better error result. But okay, the, the theorem here proves it for residual neural networks. Okay, and especially if the L infinity norm is much smaller than the L1 norm of F hat. So target function Fourier transform, yes? Which one? Hmm? This expression here. So becomes smaller if so. So okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so even if this is not true, uh, this expression, then. Um, we still have the uh, one over LK, but the constant becomes smaller. That's the thing. Okay, so, and here are some runs then to, to look at this in practice. So the, the, I don't know if you can see, but the red dots we have here, they are just a shallow neural network with uh, L equal to one. So on this axis, we have number of degrees of freedom for the neural network. And then you have the, the mean square error on this axis. Okay, and um, the yellow one here is a dense neural network for k equal to 32. So if k is constant, then L uh, changes. And uh, let's look at the green one here. Here's a residual neural network where k equal to eight and the number of degrees of freedom increases. So L increases, we see that it jumps down here. And then it seemed to continue with this slope. And the same, the blue one is also residual neural network with k equal to 64. So it seems that it follows the slope, then it jumps down, and then it continues this slope again, um, while the, the one hidden layer is, is up here. And OK, this is for one example. So it's the regularized discontinuous function in four dimensions. Okay, so here is the layer by layer uh, algorithm. So you get some data, uh, you plug in data and you get the residual neural network. Okay, you choose some number of layers L, you run the adaptive random Fourier features algorithm for the, the first layer. Um, then you plug in the, the difference between Y and Z1 in RN and then you run um, the adaptive random for your features algorithm on, on that data instead. And you continue doing that layer by layer. After you've done that, you can just uh, run any global optimizer like Adam, for example. So when we talked about these, these algorithms, adaptive random for your features, 
the beginning was so okay but who uses uh, shallow neural networks how about deep okay so we did residual neural networks and then the next question is who uses trigonometric activation functions how about other activation functions okay and that's where we are right now <laughs> so the ongoing work is together with Anamika uh, Eric Jonas and Raul. okay so in the Fourier case one of the keys was that we had access to the the inverse Fourier transform. But if you have, uh, for example, real, you don't have a Fourier transform or something. So uh, we instead will look at something called the Baron spaces. So if we consider functions um, that, admit, that admit this integral representation. Okay, so omega is some domain um, rule is a probability distribution options okay so in in the way non's paper from 2022 he introduces baron spaces and also this baron norm um, which uh, okay it requires that the function admits this form and it measures then uh, a omega and b here. So we have a there omega and b. And it takes the infimum over um, all rule that uh, this integral representation holds for, for all x. Uh, and when p uh, is the infinity, we, we have this expression for the norm. So this norm is for the real activation function. Okay. And if you change to not some other activation function, not necessarily really, you add uh, one there. And they, they, we have what's called the extended barrel norm. Okay, so the barrel spaces then they are defined as all the continuous function of the form uh, of this form that have uh, a bounded barrel norm. I mean, a finite bar barrel norm. Um, and then the question is why why use baron spaces right so they are rich spaces um, they, it's quite easy to prove the uh, direct approximation theorem and then the, also the inverse uh, approximation theorem so you can get this one over k error rate for for um, when you approximate functions there with them uh, neural networks then you can also take any neural network, one hidden layer neural network, uh, and take the limit when the k goes to infinity, then in the uh, path norm, and that the limit is also in the barrel space. Okay, so all all um, one hidden layer neural networks are there, for example. So th there are several motivations for that, but those are two key points. So another thing about Baron spaces then is that when sigma is the real activation function, the, the norm is the same for all P. So uh, we can just call it for B instead of BP. But that's not true for other activation functions. Yeah. So what, what we are doing then, we are looking at um, target functions on this form. So instead of having A here, we have uh, G that depends on uh, omega and b so we have one degree of freedom less which is uh, but you can see that okay for the if you take the degenerate measure here so you you will get something on the the baron form okay so again then if we take this expression um, and do a monte carlo approximation like we did in the fourier case we get something like this here, here. I have chosen to set, um, okay, I put the bar above x and omega. So I extend x to uh, with one dimension and put, put the one there. And for the omegas, I put the bias there. So I make it one dimension higher and put the bias there just for simplicity to write it like this instead of having the bias all the time. And... Uh, Okay, then we again have this uh, least squares problem like we had before. Um, 
and it can be shown then that following the, the Baron 93 paper that we have the one over K approximation and now the constant. Okay, so we compare in the trigonometric case, we have the Fourier transform here. Uh, now we have something a little bit different. G is um, in a sense the amplitudes. So the difference here that we don't have the expected value here because okay, uh, in, if you have the complex, uh, the e to the i omega x, this um, it, it will integrate to. I mean, the, the <clears throat> delta norm you have it's equal to one. You have uh, times one here all the time. So this is the difference here. Uh, and the Tikhonov -on parameter is yeah small. So, yeah, so okay. Um, then the question is that what is the optimal distribution if you? Uh, use these baron functions instead and uh, it turns out following the the same classical um, optimal uh, important sampling uh, proof um, you, you will get that uh, this is the optimal distribution uh, this is the, uh, the pdf that minimizes and uh, is a minimizer for this, this minimization problem uh, so we can compare them here we have F hat, and here instead we have is the amplitudes, and then we have the expected value with respect to data uh, of the activation function. Okay, so yeah, this is where we are right now. We are running some numerical experiments on this, uh, and they are promising to some extent, but I don't know, it's been promising for some time now. <laughs> Okay, so some papers I want to advertise. Okay, the Baron from 93, Bainan's paper from 2022, and then, yeah, uh, our own papers uh, from 2020 and 2022. So the first one is for the adaptive random Fourier features algorithm, and then the other one is for the uh, smaller generalization error for the uh, deep residual neural networks compared to shallow ones. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Okay, thank you, Aku, for your talk. Do we have more questions? Thank you. Um, very interesting talk, indeed. Uh, so my question, look, I have conventional function. I would like approximate it, let's say, if it's Fourier. What I pay attention is a final error, but also how many Fourier terms I need somehow very often i don't know how often but you can take many many terms it's very hard to compute them and your error is very good yes do you pay attention how many fourier terms you have here no not at all we're just looking at uh, the the width of the neural network so they do not influence on the complexity yeah no it, it, it definitely does i mean if you have a there is some results also that we haven't worked with yet but if you have a an orthogonal basis and you take uh, discrete for you, then you can get uh, spectral convergence, right? But that's, we haven't done that. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, Alex. I forgot to, I forgot to ask, look, I, I have Y data, X data, I try to find the optimal map. And uh, I choose some buzzes. You choose for year buzzes. Somebody else will take some another buzzes and assume that this. If I see that something going wrong, so meaning that I need too many terms to approximate, it's mean it could be that I choose wrong buzzes. So I, let's say I do not know function is odd, but I choose even function, even buzzes function. So, and then I simply try another buzzes. And uh, often I succeed. I can succeed. I can uh, reduce number of basis functions. Yes, and terms. Did you observe it? Something like this here, or um, we we have tried different activation functions, and we have clearly seen different results. But that depends so much on the which. So it depends on what you want to approximate, right? Mm -hmm. Also, so it, it's for what I know, it's not clear at all what which activate you just give them data which activation function should you choose it's not obvious for me 
exactly we have the yeah. same setting so we try it was some examples that it was even impossible to find uh, mapping but if after we cho changed basis it mm -hmm. was everything good yeah yeah, yeah I, I, i've seen similar things i mean not maybe as drastically but but just changing between realu sigma e the arc tan or whatever we can see different com uh, i mean the convergence rate you pretty much get the one over k for or lk if you have the real residual neural network but the constant will be different yeah, thank you something. yeah uh, any last question for Aku? maybe from zoom uh, okay then i think uh, we're over this afternoon session. Thank you, everyone.